<laughs> Thanks folks for joining. Again, my name is uh, Nancy Trevino. I am the Senior Campaign Manager at Presente.org. Thanks so much for joining our Dignidad Literaria panel. Um, I know we only have an hour, so we're going to get started. Um, and I want to first start with introductions of our panelists. Um, and I want to start with Medium, and then I guess everyone else can popcorn. If you can, again, just tell us your name, just quickly introduce yourselves to the attendees um, and where you're at right now, what city. Okay, so I'm, I'm Medium. I am in Los Angeles right now. Um, and I am a teacher and a writer and an activist. And I will pass it on to Roberto. Unmute, unmute yourself. Damn, I'm Roberto Lovato, uh, journalist, uh, sometimes activist, and author of this book, Unforgetting, that is the real motivation for my being involved in Dignidad Literaria in the first place. So if you really want to know, you got to read my book. Sorry, but that was, I'm told I got to do that. Uh, passing on to uh, David. Thank you, Roberto. Um, I'm David Bowles. I am an author, translator, and professor at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley in uh, the borderlands of South Texas. But right now, I am six hours north of there in Austin, where my daughter and son live. I was installing my son in his uh, sister's apartment where they will now be roommates. I'm sure that's their dream. <laughs> um, and yes, um, as Roberto said, sometimes activists is a part of the Unión Literaria. Matt? Hi, everybody. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for coming together for this panel. Uh, my name is Matt Nelson. I'm the executive director of Presente.org. And um, yeah, we're the uh, largest digital Latinx organizing group at the intersection of media, culture, and power. And so we build power, change culture, and stay presente. And yeah, before then, I, I did a lot of things, including running a pizzeria. And uh, presente also has a book out, um, uh, emergencyelection.org. It's about how to uh, turn out uh, mass movement um, in November and beyond. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks everyone for the intro. Um, and again, thanks for the attendees for joining us. Um, again, I'm Nancy Trevino, also with Presente.org. Um, and we're gonna kick it off the discussion. Um, you're here to hear more about our Dignidad Literaria campaign. Um, and just as a preface, um, I think what makes this campaign really special to us is one, um, it's Latinx driven. Um, it's, uh, I feel like the epitome of what cultural power and organizing can do um, when we're holding corporations accountable. Um, and all these amazing writers and organizers who are here will kind of give us a deep dive into our strategy, how the campaign just grew really organically. Um, we engage a ton of our members um, and supporters from across the country um, and we're culminating in this really amazing moment um, and want to bring you all in um, to see how we can continue building power together. Um, so I'm going to first um, hand it over to Miriam Gurba um, who kind of sparked this amazing um, campaign and this conversation um, and um, we'll break that um, conversation into three pieces, um, kind of uh, the way that Matt Nelson so greatly puts it is um, kind of like the story of the battle, um, the battle of the story. Um, and then we'll get into uh, strategy discussion, reflection, and take some uh, questions from you all. So uh, stick around for that. Um, and I'll hand that over um, to Miriam and David to kind of open us up with, with how, um, how we created um, Dignidad Literaria. Okay, I'll, um, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about how a certain book fell into my lap and, uh, <laughs> and, and how I responded to said book. So I, um, I am an occasional book critic and I was asked by uh, an editor at Ms. Magazine to review, um, to review uh, American Dirt. 
When I wrote my review and sent it to my editor, there was um, an unusual lag in response, like an unusual lag time, which um, I interpreted it as uh, slightly ominous. <laughs> and lo and behold, um, an editor told me that uh, my review was not going to be published and I would be uh, paid a kill fee. Um, and the editor, the editor communicated to me that the reason that the review would not be published was because it was so biting and because um, I was not uh, well known enough to write something so biting. Um, and I was really bothered by that response because uh, the point of criticism is critique. <laughs> I was essentially being told that uh, that that pages reserved for critique were actually reserved for something else, and I got the sense that they were reserved for uh, quasi ads. You know what I mean? Like really, the, the 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 book reviews were being used as like ad space and ad vehicles. So I wrote an essay about the experience in which I embedded the initial review that went unpublished. And I also critiqued um, the publishing industry at large. Um, and that essay was published by an academic site called Tropics of Meta. Um, that essay resonated with a lot of people, I think because of an incredible amount of frustration that um, people of color and other minoritized folks have with the industry and, um, and the rest is history, so to speak. Uh, one of the folks who initially um, kind of intellectually collaborated with me and, and took my critique seriously was David. David uh, reached out to me through Twitter and then went on to, um, to, to pen his own critique. And uh, Roberto uh, reached out to me through social media platforms as well. And so things coalesced through those platforms. So much of the initial connection happened through social media. So given that, I'll, I'll now pass uh, the baton to, to David because you and I corresponded quite a bit in those early days. Mute, 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 you're muted. Oh, one of these days we'll get used to unmuting ourselves. Um, yeah, in those early days um, when I read Medium's piece, I was just um, immediately well, taken by the, like, the incredible writing and, and incisiveness of thought behind everything. Um, and I was inspired, well, first to share it because I believed her. It, it, was, it was a clear, um, honest uh, critique of the book. And then I, I found somebody up here in Austin, in fact, who had uh, an advanced review copy of it. And I drove up here and over the course of a Saturday, read it um, off of my friend's tablet and then went back down to the valley to start writing about it as well. And so the, as Miriam has said, the three of us were doing this work and Roberto reached out and basically said, why don't we you know, try to get Macmillan to have a conversation with us, not just about this book, but like using this book as a way to table a conversation, to open up a conversation with them about the lack of literary dignity uh, um, in publishing. And he had already been thinking about the term dignity, I think that idea for some time um, in other concept, in other contexts. Um, so we, we talked it over um, and then you know, contacted McMillan and they immediately replied, um, Bob Miller of Flatiron Books um, immediately replied, wanting to sit down with us. And so there was some behind the scenes, like working out the logistics of that. Um, and finally in uh, early February, February 3rd, we were able to fly to New York City, first met, strategize with Matt um, and uh, Nancy and the rest of, of the team at Presente. Uh, and then we went in and we, we sat down at this table with the president, Don Weisberg, with the, the head of uh, Flatiron Books, Bob Miller, and with these, all these other executives and um, editors and they were not planning to have to make any kind of decisions that day. They, they, that was the very first thing they said. We're here to listen to you. We're going to be listening to a lot of different groups, but we are not going to make any decisions today. 
And we told them, there is no way we are going to leave this room today without your making some solid um, decisions about the future and you know committing to doing specific things. And so we had a four-pronged approach. We're, we're really good at uh, understanding each other's uh, strengths and weaknesses so that we can work together to, to attack a problem from multiple different angles. And um, we were able at the end of those two hours to get them to commit to three things. First of all, to admitting that yes, they have a problem um, with Latinx representation, both in the books they acquire and in the editors that they have working on those books. That number two, um, they would, you know, well, part of number one is they would come up with a plan to address it. Number two was in within 30 days, they would give us an update on their progress toward that plan. And the, the third thing they agreed to was that within 90 days, they would have a, you know, a full uh, substantial plan that they could show people that they would continue working on. Um, it's not that they would solve the problem in 90 days, but that they would have a substantial plan that they could show us. And we were able then after that meeting, um, and they were, frankly, you could see them shell-shocked at the end of the meeting. They were not, um, they were not expecting uh, what happened when you sit down with four Mexican Americans and I mean four Latinx, sorry, um, uh, people and try to um, and try to to wrangle with them. We were not having any of their condescension, any of their tone policing. Um, Medium was the person they wanted to tone police the most, especially the men in in the room, um, and she. Uh, she's not having any of that shit. So she took care of that. And um, there was a, a moment when a lot of the women at Macmillan and Flatiron um, turned in our favor and the, the, the tone of the conversation changed and, and we gained the upper hand, I would say. Um, we also had right on our side and justice on our side. And that, I think that's really, really important. And we, we knew specifically what we thought they should do. We had a plan, a recommended plan for them to go with and so forth. And, um, so they, they've stepped to, they, we, we come away from that meeting, we go down, we have our, our, our uh, press conference and um, go back to our respective places in the world, Texas, California, and so forth. And at the end of the, the 30 days, they did um, give us that update. But after those 30 days, COVID struck, right? And things got really, really complicated. We... Um, if you've been paying close attention to this, you will know that eventually, yes, in the 90 days, they did some substantial things. They removed perhaps the, one of the, the most problematic people um, in this process, John Sargent, the, um, the, the, the CEO who was being way too involved in the artistic decisions of Macmillan, and he stepped away in there and they're instituting a council of diverse people to, to control things. And, and there are a lot of other things that they've put in place, um, there's still a lot more work to be done, both within Macmillan and the rest of the publishing industry, but we won a clear victory for you know, Latinx people and the, in the US. Um, and we can now, you know, at, with the basis of this victory, go on and do more things. And, and for that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Matt and Roberto, who will talk a little bit more about our strategy going forward. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you both for really launching this uh, important campaign for all of us. Uh, wouldn't have been possible without Miriam's just biting, acidic, brilliant critique. And then David's kind of piling on his, his capabilities onto this, driving to Austin every other week. Um, so um, I think what I want to talk about is the way that Strategy meets storytelling, political organizing strategy meets storytelling. Anybody familiar with Netroots and the work of online organizing knows that you have to, you have to have good storytelling capabilities to keep people's attention so that they click these buttons in these obscene ways that we ask them to do in our mediated society. So, uh, you know, I came quite frankly late to the game. Uh, they had already start, Miriam and Debbie had already whipped up a firestorm out of Long Island and Texas and kind of whoosh, it took off and it, you know a lot of people started paying attention to this and I'm here looking at it trying to finish the stuff on my own book which you know is, 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 is basically the story told part of the story told in American dirt except from an actually existing Central American perspective. So my motivation and my read on this my read of Miriam's essay 
and David's critiques was like, damn, these people are speaking my language. And, and I think it goes to show that any campaign always at its initial launch needs a vision and a clear set of values. So when Miriam says pendeja in her title, that's a, that's, you know, it's funny, but it's also boom, al grano. It speaks to a lot of us. It captures our attention. And then, you know, you, you kind of dive into the rest of the, uh, the essay. So, uh, you know, I, I, I forgot to mention, I also co-founded that August organization, Presente.org. So I thought, hey, man, you know, these folks have picked up on something that's touched a nerve deep inside our community. That has, what is it, David, like 1% of books in the United States that are Latino? Yes, uh, when you take 1%, both children, children and 1%, adults. 1%, and I like to say, as in, as in, as on Sunday talk shows, as in progressive politics even, as in the national narrative of the United States, Latinos are the tropical sidekicks to the pe real storytellers of America, quote unquote, right? That's how we're positioned and we're pissed off and fed up. And so Miriam's pendeja comment captured it. And then David's kind of Texas firestorm version added to it. And so I thought, okay, I co-founded Presente. Let's bring Presente into this. And then we, let's pivot away from this white woman and on to the, to the larger uh, gray eminence in the room, uh, the publishing industry itself, right? So we, we wanted to take this book and make it a referendum on the publishing industry itself. And then Presente.org came in and then we combined what Presente knows how to do with what Miriam and David and I know how to do as writers. And we had at it. And I think I'll leave it there for uh, uh, the, the director of Presente.org uh, Matt Nelson to come in and, 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 and you know, he's, he's familiar with these net root circles. So take it away, Matt. And uh, maybe before then, actually it'd be great to hear, um, Medium, if you could just talk about, like, or if somebody on the panel can talk about, like, what the American Dirt controversy, what the, the center of it was, because probably a lot of people don't know who are tuning in. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the controversy itself. So um, American Dirt is a thriller uh, that was published by Flatiron. Um, and it was um, written uh, by Janine Cummins and acquired by um, Amy Einhorn. And Amy Einhorn um, gained quite a bit of notoriety for um, another garbage book, uh, The Help. Um, so uh, she has a track record for um, acquiring um, uh, harmful novels. Um, so I, I identified um, certain problems with the book itself, um, and namely the book um, misrepresents um, the immigration crisis that we have been in forever. So it, it misrepresents and distorts that crisis and the book centers the United States heroically. Um, and that was what I found um, incredibly problematic about the book. Um, the book, however, was endorsed by Oprah. It was chosen um, as one of our book club selections and um, Flatiron and Macmillan threw their institutional weight behind uh, supporting the book and uh, supporting their author as well. And they used um, racist rhetoric to do that. Um, they painted those of us who were critiquing the book as opponents of free speech, which is incredibly ironic given that we're exercising our ability, or that we're exercising our First Amendment rights through critique. Um, and we're not calling for anybody to be quieted or to have their storytelling abilities um, squelched. Um, if a person writes a harmful and shitty novel, they ought to be critiqued for it. Um, they shouldn't be, uh, held to a different set of standards. Um, 
And uh, those of us who critiqued the work were framed as, uh, Roberto likes to put it, as, as a brown barbarian horde, as, as, as a potentially violent group of people. And again, the irony is that, um, again, the irony is that uh, Flatiron and Cummins presented themselves as uh, our saviors. And then when we critiqued our saviors for the salvation that they offered us and our community at large, suddenly they want to beat us down and silence us. Um, and so uh, the gift of their salvation was a painful one. <laughs> so I'll just sort of end it there. I want to add really quickly, if I may, Matt, before yeah. you continue. Um, the, the other super horrible issues with American Dirt were the fact that um, of course the author was advanced um, more than a million dollars for the book and for the translation rights and so forth, when typically um, Latinx authors and um, BIPOC authors in general uh, get much smaller advances. Um, the book was anointed by Flatiron Macmillan and the, the network of journalists and people like Oprah that they have in their corner as the book on immigration for 2020. Um, it was chosen for Oprah's book club before she even read the book. It was, um, th there was just this massive uh, corporate strategy around making this book by someone who's not from the Mexican American community, not from Mexico, not an immigrant, be the story of the immigrant ex experience um, in, in 2020. So that was definitely a problem. And the problem is exacerbated by the fact that there's such poor representation as Roberto has put out in the chat. I was kind of laying out those numbers. We know them specifically um, for uh, children's and teen lit because we have people that work on that. The publishing doesn't release the numbers from adult lit. And so we have to do some extrapolation and, um, and kind of project those numbers out. And they're probably a lot worse for adult literature, but roughly as Roberto uh, pointed out, about 1% of books written and published every year are by Latinx um, authors, um, even though we make up considerably like 18% of the population considerably larger than 1%. Um, and you know, this is problematic in lots of ways. The lack of representation um, uh, of Latinx people and the Latinx experience and Latinx authors and children's and teen literature means that kids grow up, first of all, if they're Latinx, not seeing themselves reflected in the books that they read. And then if they're not Latinx, never seeing la Latinx people as participants in the intellectual and academic life that is you know, promoted by schools. So we are erased from that conversation altogether, which causes psychological damage in children and makes them grow up to see their, their identity as inferior somehow. And that if they wanna make it academically, professionally world, they have to, to divorce themselves from their Latinx past. And it makes other children in the world grow up to, to be racist deeply, deeply racist, um, not in the, uh, hey, you stupid spick kind of way, but in the, I am part of this racist white hegemony that controls and throttles the life out of people who are not part of it. Um, and that is something that publishing has got to come to grips with. I, I, I spoke with Don Weisberg on the telephone on May 28th and told him, um, when he tried to get me to see that he is a progressive like I am and we're on the same page, I'm like, dude, you are not a progressive. You are regressive. You are a bottom liner. You're about profit only and you're about getting a profit however you can. You have this nice little um, uh, facade, this guilt covering of progressivism and I'm doing the right thing and I'm you know, advocating for the little brown people, but fuck you, no, that's not what you're actually doing, right? you are earning money off the backs of people and you are promoting, you are a part of the problem. Um, and so until they own up to their complicity and the problems that we have in this, in this society and begin to do radical things about it, not just acquiring a new book every season and, and advancing somebody hundreds of thousands of dollars, but publishing dozens and dozens and dozens of more books every year, which is gonna be painful and mean less, less profit for, for people who are accustomed to getting it. Until it happens, we're not going to have literary dignity. All right, Matt, I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure that we address this. Uh, and I'm gonna jump in. This is Nancy again, moderating. Um, 
campaign manager at presente.org. Um, and just thanks so much for all kind of walking folks through at this point, David, Roberto, Miriam. Um, and for, all, you know, that context, um, I think one thing that we kind of just like talked through really quickly were the concrete um, kind of wins based on the demands that we went with initially at the meeting on February 3rd in New York City at their headquarters. Um, and out of that meeting, just to let folks know, um, McMillan agreed to um, include substantial increases in Latinx titles and staff across their company. Um, so that was like a huge commitment. We didn't know if they were going to follow through, but we wanted to I just wanted to lay out, you know, what the what the um, agreements were initially and where we've gotten to um, at this at this moment. So I'll hand it over to you, Matt, if you want to, um, before you get into your piece, just let folks know what are some of the concrete um, kind of things we achieved um, as, as we've kind of organized this campaign. Yes, and hi, everybody. And yeah, I will, um, I'll touch on that too. You know, I, I, I'm really glad that we, you know, are having this conversation and I really appreciate everybody on the panel and um, the Presente team and Nancy. And I think like, like, you know, we believe in the power of our stories as, as the, as Latinx people, as the power of our culture and the wholeness of our voices, um, I think that that was a big rallying cry. Like it was like these big publishing giants, folks were not gonna allow them to profit off of um, destroying and, and taking and, and rewriting our stories and our history and our culture, um, profiting from um, the same type of cultural exploitation and racism that that we're um, that we've endured for for so long, and so in in the beginning of and and now when you look at what's happening around the country now with the incredible uprisings um, addressing police violence and systemic racism and white supremacy, you know this was. Um, we see even more that that it's it's to talk about dignity and to fight for dignity in publishing dignity in in everyday um, um, society is something that's very powerful and I do think that it was um, so our role at Presente you know we work with more than a half million people across the country to do. Um, to, to get people involved, to connect people with what they care about with what they can do. Or, and to like, and also like what they learn about, like they learn about this, this, this um, scandal in publishing and how, um, and how like, like a racialized profiteering um, happens in book publishing. They learn about how powerful um, the publishing industry is to um, to tell our stories and to tell our narratives, and we know that who controls these narratives determines what's okay in society, what's accepted. You know, it's it's narratives like American Dirt that allow for um, family separation policies and and kids in cages to be okay for for large parts of of the country. And so we understand that the power of our stories and the power of culture relates to what happens to our families on a daily basis. Um, how we're, so, so culture, you know, had to be treated as like a strategy and a goal around movement building. And who better to do it than, um, than writers and activists and teachers and poets, um, combined with, with a larger um, activist network and, um, and effort, basically making this a public fight, but being rooted in those culture makers who understand um, the power of story and the power of the word and the power of culture. Um, so I think we came to the February 3rd meeting with that on our side. Um, we came 
um, also with with the power of 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 defending um, um, human rights and knowing that we were about transformative change, um, not transactional change. Um, we could have easily won very simple transactional things from this company. And I think even, even coming to February, we were like, you know, you have to totally change how your, your company does business. It also wasn't just about Macmillan, it was about all of publishing. And it was about um, equity and dignity and respect. It was beyond the sort of traditional diversity um, uh, paradigm that's often done in these, in these corporate accountability campaigns when they remain transactional. And so we got them to commit to company-wide improvements and how they um, essentially how they treat Latinx writers and how they treat Latinx intellectual work, how they, basic basic respect to um, our communities um, within the publishing world I think is the main thing we want it was it was a recognition and respect followed by commitments to dramatically change leadership in the company to dramatically change um, practice in terms of how they acquire books and how they um, uh, connect with with the community to get books and a commitment to, um, to greater transparency and opening the door for more accountability. So we secured much of this um, a month after the meeting, which is sort of what was the check-in point. Um, and then of course, like the pandemic and COVID happened. And I think, you know, but no one is better prepared for like isolation revolution and future thinking of a, of a beautiful society than like writers are, than authors are, than poets are. And so I, I felt like we were like the most prepared campaign to understand, okay, now that we have, you know, a pandemic, we're still facing the other um, daily threats to people's safety related to the, to um, law enforcement, ICE, you know, state violence, um, family separation, um, and of course, we're, we're currently still facing the existential threats of climate change. Um, how do we continue this powerful network? Because the other thing that, that we were able to form was uh, a series of dozens of events around the country, utilizing Presente's distributed organizing platform. So we really opened this up to, um, there were Dignidad uh, events with, um, local artists and local authors. And I think that, um, you know, David Miriam and Roberto's leadership in the space of, of and, and they, they don't usually talk about this, but, but they are really, have really inspired so many more and connected with so many more writers who are like, yes, let's, as we transform publishing, you know, this gives me the space to say, you know, yeah, I want to, I want to be part of this. I want, you know, I am an artist. I want to be part of this, of this, of this dignified project of adding and, and really um, shaping the next phase of how, um, of how Latinx stories are told. And so I, I do think that this campaign has, has, you know, yeah, definitely inspired new writers, but also just brought together what is previously mostly an invisibilized group of people who every day are really struggling to, um, you know, to, to write and be part of, of this powerful um, culture shifting um, effort that we need to do. Because right now we, we are in a moment of transformation and it's gonna take the artists and the writers to help guide us to that, you know, to these better tomorrows. And so that's where I think um, some of the power of this comes from, and I and I just really appreciative for the people who really catalyze this, which are those doing the hard work of um, of creating art, and um, and that's really special. And I think that it's rare for an organizing group and for um, for like like you know politics are often way too separated from art and from culture, and I think it. It's, this campaign really showed that like, yes, people care. We can win transformative change. We can 
we can take on the biggest and baddest shapers of people's perceptions and culture and we can win. And I guess the last thing I'll say is like, you know, there has been a, a greater focus on Hollywood and on television and on film in terms of like, they need to do better, they need to be less racist, they need more representation. But what a lot of folks didn't understand and what we, what, you know, we learned from the process is there's such a connection between the publishing world and what you then later see in theaters, what you later see on TV, there is a synergy to this, to this corporate um, uh, hegemonic force that often people ignore. Like there, there's been a lot of culture campaigns in the last few years. Very few have actually focused on, on books and literature, which in many ways, you know, when we saw this from, from Oprah's involvement, which I hope somebody can talk about a bit, um, you know, it really does shape the entire cultural sphere. So it, it, you know, we've, we've gone at a center of power. And I think going forward, because now so much has shifted, I think that we're in a great place to really um, um, even move these, move the whole industry more and, and, and add value to other cultural campaigns as well. Awesome, thanks for that, Matt. And we have oh, like three more minutes and I wanna give us those three minutes. Um, you know, you, you expressed a really great, like kind of the moment that we're in, kind of our strategy um, and some reflections. Um, and so we're wanting to kick off in three minutes, just the Q&A for folks. So if folks have questions, you can go ahead and drop them in the Q&A box here in Zoom. Um, but if there's any other reflections that either Matt or David, um, Roberto or Miriam want to share before we get into the Q&A portion, um, go ahead. I think what Medium um, just posted in the chat is really important, that there is a, um, and it, it dovetails with what Matt was saying, there is this collaborative process, this pipeline between publishing and Hollywood um, that then takes what I was mentioning about how the literature so, you know, published by the big five and then selected by school districts to put in the classrooms, all of that um, you know, shapes uh, students' minds and, and promotes a worldview that is racist and destructive of uh, minoritized groups. Um, likewise, that pipeline then takes, for people who don't read very much, takes the, the uh, limited representation of Latinx and other BIPOC groups and spreads it throughout the entertainment industry uh, uh, as a whole. And one of the things that we've been doing is working with other groups to try to come up with ways to fight that for example, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, uh, run by Medium's best bud, Joaquin Castro, to do, uh, <laughs> this Roberto, he says, um, you know, brought, has, has had com difficult conversations both with, um, you know, the, the larger production companies in Hollywood and with the big five and is, is calling them to account and demanding data and information from them. And, and we're really encouraging um, the, the caucus and other like state and federal um, uh, politicians to consider more oversight, more government oversight. You know, of course, the capitalist mindset is, you know, let's do away with all of the, you know, these regulations. Well, especially in publishing um, and in, in entertainment industry, we need to have greater regulation of the dignity of minoritized groups um, in, in the, this nation. Uh, thank you, David. And I wanted to add, you know, to that, uh, a couple of you've made those points about, um, you know, targeting the big publishing company, you know, companies at large, right? Like our fight isn't over. We're still organizing to demand dignity and equity across all the big five publishing companies. Um, so this is just like our initial start, right? Where we're not done yet. So there's definitely many ways to plug in um, and continue organizing. Um, in your local cities, um, in your towns, and across the country, like um, folks talked about um, throughout this discussion. Um, so we're at 12.40 now, um, and I wanted to open it up for questions and answers. And we have a couple um, in the queue here, and I would just say whoever 
wants to um, answer, can, they can. Um, so I'm going to uh, start with Raunel uh, Urquiza's question. Um, and that's how can people participate and uplift diverse voices in the literary community? Well, one way is to buy our books. Um, I, I guess I think that, um, you know, especially now during a pandemic, um, you know, people really want connection. They want context. People want, um, want to dig deeper into what they're thinking about and what they're reading. And I, I do think that, and it answers the other question about where you can follow. I think the, you know, one of the great strengths of this campaign was the hashtag, was the Dignidad Literaria hashtag that really united, you know, unified a lot of the um, organizing. And I think the organizing still needs to continue. You know, like I mentioned, there are, there are dozens of events that people found at somos.presente.org and started one. And, and, and I would encourage people to continue to do this type of organizing. And the, because the other thing that this campaign did is that it pulled politics into culture. You know, the, the Hispanic caucus got involved because this was a, a cultural, the, the, the the cultural power was too much for them not to get involved. And so I think now, like, like maybe if you're tired of following the, the, the latest, you know, horrible breaking news, but you still want to be politically engaged, you can do it through culture. You can do it through um, engaging in, in books like so many more people are. There's so many more people using public libraries now than ever before online. And so we have like, and so I think that, um, that we really believe through this campaign that um, this is a this is a, a public forum. Um, organizing should be in the public sphere, and um, it should be participatory. So I think, you know, folks should still engage with the hashtag on social media, and should use the distributed organizing platform to organize, you know, events or book clubs or just we need to keep the connection, and we need more empathy. And, and, and love to get us through what are really horrible, horrible times where there's so much um, death and uncertainty and, and economic collapse and racism, all the white supremacy, all the stuff that we're enduring and really suffering through right now, um, you know, books are, books are a, a vaccine and an antidote, literature, is is a salve um, for people, and I think that 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 I, I really don't think that can be underestimated. Um, so I really think that part of part of what I've learned through this this campaign and really appreciate is to turn to to literature, and there's so many great writers that that we can do, and and also like you know you can become your your own writing inspiration as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, oh, yeah, Nancy, Nancy, just real quick. Um, uh, the other thing, I mean, I said it kind of flippantly uh, to you know, buy our books, but it's, it is true um, if you are a librarian, a teacher, um, if you're involved in any way with the running of school district, making sure that you acquire titles by Latinx authors, by authors of color, is, is definitely a way that you can do things. If you are just a, a person who checks books out from your library, um, you know, make a list of the Latinx titles that you want to have. Um, yes, there you go. <laughs> and request those, make sure they're on the shelves and your libraries. Lots of just basic things that you can do to, to ensure that the publishers know there's a demand for the books that they say there's not a demand for. I wanted to also chime in and say something about book clubs and study groups. Um, so over the last several months, there's been a proliferation of reading lists that have appeared online, right? There are all these anti-racist reading lists. And I keep wondering how much people are actually engaging with the curriculum that's on those lists. Like to me, it seems very performative for people to post those lists, but what kind of accountability um, exists 
um, in communities where people are adopting those are people actually forming study groups. So what kind of action is, um, is being spurred by those groups? And, and like to me, ideally, a book club isn't necessarily just a group of people who read a book and then discuss it. I think that like ideally a book club um, could also, I mean, not ideally, but under, under a lot of circumstances, a book club, especially if it's like a book club intended to raise political consciousness, should extend beyond consciousness and also be like an activist organization. So if this group of people gets together and assigns themselves a curriculum, studies it and comes to understand it, how does that then translate to an action plan for this group of people? And so I'm, um, take the information that that you learn and that you struggle with and then apply it to actual struggles in the world because otherwise i think that like the, the, so many of 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 these book clubs and these study sessions just become like information hoarding sites, you know what I mean? And like capitalism just urges us to hoard. And I think some of what we hoard is information too. And so what we do with that information and what we do with that knowledge is critical to like bettering the world. So um, take a book club, but also make it an active club. Awesome, thanks so much for that medium. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next question since we have three more to go. Um, so there's a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, what do you have to say about Latinx literature icon, icons like Sandra Cisneros defending American dirt or in all the publishing industry? Well, uh, I'll take that one. Uh, First of all, I don't want to cast aspersions on any specific writers. That's just not my way. But I will say that what Dignidad Literaria did was draw a line in the sand between what I call, between those of us who are like Miriam and David and myself, working class authors who express real stories that haven't yet been embraced by the larger industry because the industry doesn't like real working class stories. It likes uh, the people that I think are lying on the other side of the sand, lying in the sand, which is the people that pursue the path of what I call the folklorico industrial complex of US Latino literature. In other words, we get up, we color ourselves, we dress up and we dance for the man so that the man accepts us and we, we, we position ourselves and we, we distort ourselves in order to be accepted and to get big money. That's kind of the path to success that, um, that, that, that publishing as it exists has paid for Latino authors by and large. There are exceptions. There are, you know, in, we're gonna start seeing more real stories, but by and large, the path to success it pays, has been paved by minstrelsy. So we put a line in the sand, um, just kind of like just saying, no, that's not, that's not the dignified way to present ourselves. It's profitable economically and politically because like I think progressive circles in many ways like to see us dance tropical salsa and cumbia and fucking rancheras too. So, um, you know, we have a lot of work to do in the United States. And I think that, um, you know, those authors that came out in favor of American Dirt calling it not just the American novel, but the novel of Las Americas, comparing it to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Gabriela Mistral, and other greats of Latin American literature is kind of like, you know, not 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 my my cup of tea, literarily speaking. I think um, I think we need we need to reconsider what what we do. And 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 lastly, I think the most important thing for me that came out of Dignidad Literaria was we ourselves. We brown people, Afro Latinx people, trans Latinx people who are now fed up and publicly showing that we are absolutely fed up with the minstrelization, the tacoization, the Carmen Mirandization, the you know, Tio Tacoization of our of our literature and our lives. So uh, I think I want to just incite and encourage everyone to continue the work of, of calling people to task when they write trash like American Dirt and to also write your own stories, 
You know, write your own stories. People will respond. Thank you. Thanks for that, Roberto. Um, before we move on to the next question, do any of the other panelists want to respond? Look, we all have our tios and tias in our own families, <laughs> uh, uncles and aunts, those of you who are not Latinx, who, you know, have a couple of beers and start saying stupid ass shit. So, um, in addition to the really, really cogent analysis that Roberto gave, you will sometimes have people who just are caught at a weird moment or who just have like some skewed political um, ideas or whatever who will support something. And then later on, sometimes they'll be like, oh shit, I really shouldn't have supported that. What the hell was I thinking? You know, too many, like, you know, too many, Dos Equis, that, that, too many Coronas. <laughs> yeah, you're right, because they would be drinking Coronas and not Dos Equis, right? Um, and um, so I, there's that as well. So sometimes uh, there, are, there are some people who are like engaging in this menstrual street that, that, uh, that everyone just talked about. And there are other people who are just, whatever, their agents like, hey, you know, give a blurb to this book. And they read like a chapter and like, oh yeah, it's fucking good. And then you know, there's also that kind of nonsense. So um, there are multiple reasons why Latinx authors may have been supported may have been supportive of American Dirt initially. Um, sometimes it's just their own career that's at stake and you know, their publishers um, need for them to say good things about whatever the book has that's been anointed is. Yeah, and one of the things that I think this, this has brought up, the American Dirt controversy has brought up is, is um, you know, a relationship to whiteness, which I think, um, you know, Latinx communities really have to face in a real way. Um, but it also, uh, the, what Roberto was talking about isn't, isn't unique to Latinx people in terms of, of navigating white dominance and white supremacy. And so it, it's, a, it's an opportunity, I think, an opportunity to build more solidarity among Black, Indigenous, people of color communities, which is, also where I hope the future of this campaign goes is to, um, you know, and I know all of us on the panel, you know, are, are in solidarity and fighting alongside the movement for black lives in this new period of uprising. And I think it, but it is an, a, a way to really look at um, not just the, um, the, uh, how we, how, um, our communities have had to perform to the white power structure, but also how we can unify with others who have been um, at the receiving end of that, of that, of that bludgeon, that bludgeon of, um, of, of cultural hegemony and white supremacy. Um, because I, I do think that it's, it's definitely both in literature, it's, it's definitely in politics. And when I see, um, you know, even like the, the the politics in Congress changing to be more um, unapologetic in terms of of who's going to be in the Congress. It's inspiring to see that we, you know, we, that's part of what we have to organize. Is that cultural shifts they just don't happen on their on their own. You know, white supremacy won't be dismantled on its own, and um, we have to do it and also be in solidarity with others. Um, who are, who are in a similar fight. Thanks, man. Thanks, Ali. Um, we have five minutes left, so we're gonna get to the last question from Carmen. Uh, do you feel that the panel that met with Oprah and the author of American Dirt did enough to express the outrage, not only about that novel, but about the lack of representation in publishing? Nope. I mean, it, you know, the, the fact that she didn't bring the principal critics of, of the book and her reaction to the book onto the stage with her is an indication of how she wanted to manipulate things. She wanted to be the person controlling that conversation. And while, yes, um, Julissa and the other panelists that were there made some great points and, and, you know, hammered her on a couple of things, she still was in control of the conversation. If it had been <laughs> Miriam and Roberto and I on the stage with her, shit would have gone very differently. And again, this is not to put down the work that those, those three um, great women did, but um, 
she mentioned our names. She knows who we are and she knows what, how things would have gone down. And that was not the kind of conversation she wanted to, to play this, this game to, to be a, a both, you know, both cider kind of, um, ostensibly logical and calm, rational uh, umpire when she is an author published by Flatiron who has a financial um, stake in the success of American Dirt. And she is not the person who should have been like, even running that. She should have been one of the people having to answer for her actions when, while somebody else, more neutral, was running the conversation. But yeah, I mean, it is what it is, to quote Donald Trump. Context for that, it just to add to what David's saying is that we were pressuring Oprah to meet with us at the time in the lead up to this. We had asked and were supported by authors in critiquing her support of this book, American Dirt. And we then sent our own letter requesting a meeting with her to talk about these issues. And we sent it through all different means. Her operatives knew we wanted the meeting before the show. And what we got was you know, if I was a more colonized self, like I used to be, I would have been excited to see my name on the screen as Oprah was saying it. There's my name, Roberto Lovato, in the closed caption. I captured it for posterity because I want to show, hey, look, man, I was on Oprah, at least in name. Of course, I was disembodied and, 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 and I'm framed as kind of marginal to this divisive rhetoric and strategy that Oprah pulled. It was clear it was a it was a divide and conquer strategy. You know, and that's what's gonna happen to us time and again. When we pressure people in power, we will have to face that they will select people from our own group who look and smell like us, who eat, you know, tacos estilo Michoacan or carnitas estilo Michoacan or pupusas estilo San Vicente, where's my mom's from and talk like us, but are really kind of dancing the Carmen Miranda for the 21st century dance. So, so we have to be prepared for what I call the, 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 the politics of um, intersectional empire, because empire is now going to be playing with color, with race, with class, with uh, sexual identity and other identities. So um, be prepared, I think, beyond just this, we have to be prepared. That's what I see, quite frankly, with the move to put Kamala Harris up there. Just like, you know, we're gonna cop and police and destroy you like Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump. We're gonna cage children by the thousands like Obama did. But hey, si se puede. Yes, we can. Right? So I'll just thank leave you. it at that. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, we're wrapping it up now. Uh, follow the hashtag Dignidad Literaria um, to get involved. Um, visit Presente.org as well. Thank you so much for your questions and joining. Thank you, panelists. Uh, we hope you have a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.